Kuwait, I'm the Associate Director of the Getty Research Institute. And I was one of the curatorial team who worked on, who had the privilege actually of working on this wonderful exhibition, The Cave Temples of Dumong, Buddhist Art on Chinese Silk Room. The exhibition features more than a thousand years of Buddhist art, and you can see or probably have seen exceptionally fine examples that we borrowed for the show that are more than a thousand years old themselves from European institutions. It also celebrates the 28-year collaboration that the Getty Conservation Institute has had with the Dongwang Academy. It is the longest collaboration of any of the programs at the Getty. And um, it's, it's, it just seems like it's never gonna stop. We'll keep working and keep working with the wonderful people in Western China. Welcome to the second of four lectures on subjects that are related to the exhibition. The lead sponsor was the Robert H. N. Ho Foundation based in Hong Kong. The Ho Foundation has a special mission to foster the appreciation of Chinese arts and culture in order to advance global understanding of it, and particularly to cultivate the understanding of Buddhism, not only in a historical context, but relating to our contemporary world and lives in it. This afternoon's speaker is John Kishnick, who is the Robert H. N. Ho Family Foundation Chair in Buddhist Studies at Stanford University. He was born in Hong Kong. He studied at UC Berkeley and at Stanford, and prior to taking up his present professorship at Stanford, Dr. Kishnick was for nearly a decade a research fellow at the Institute of History and Philology at the Academica Sinica in Taiwan, and he subsequently taught at the University of Bristol and at Hong Kong Polytechnic before returning to California. So he's definitely a Pacific Rim kind of man. Professor Kishnick's research institutes and his publications interact really nicely with our subjects for the exhibitions, and that was the reason why we invited him to come, and we're very happy to have him here today. Most of his work has then been published in two particular books. The first, The Eminent Monk, Monastic Ideals in Medieval China, which is the period of the exhibition, and in it he examines over 500 biographies of Chinese monks, analyzing the stories of the monks who were known in their time as ascetics, wonder workers, miracle workers, magic magicians, and scholars. His second book, The Impact of Buddhism on Chinese Material Culture, looks at the ways that Buddhism shaped the material world in China. And this includes everything. It's, it's the daily life and then special uh, spiritual life as well. So icons, relics, food, clothing, bridge building, engineering, and even chairs. This afternoon, he's promised to take us from the objects in the exhibition, which have survived so fortunately, and which we now care for and value so deeply, back to their makers and their culture at the time. Professor Kishnick, We'll talk about the people who made them a thousand years ago. More specifically, he will explore their beliefs about heaven and hell and karma, which was the moral force that governs the universe. These are questions that people in the exhibitions have asked me about as I've given tours, and so I'm sure that you're thinking about these subjects as well. Please join me in welcoming Professor Kishin. much easier to give a talk about Dunhuang. Uh, now the audience tends to be so well educated and to have read so much about Dunhuang, and many audience members have probably been to Dunhuang. 
that it's becoming increasingly difficult to tell you something you don't already know, but I'll, uh, I'll do my best. Whether at the caves themselves or here at the Getty, on first viewing, it's the technical skill of the paintings at Dunhuang that dazzles. It's the shapes and swirls, it's the colors and the contours that catch the eye. Beyond technique, with uh, close to 500 large painted caves cut into the cliffs, plastered and painted over the course of um, a thousand years, the scale of the whole elaborate complex is consistently awe-inspiring. The same holds true for the documents discovered at the beginning of the 20th century. Hidden away in a sealed cave for close to a thousand years, manuscripts from Dunhuang give the same impression of skill, artistry, and magnitude. Tens of thousands of handwritten manuscripts survive from that sealed cave. Some in exquisite calligraphy, on paper, a Chinese invention that by this point could yield some very refined specimens. So I hope as you go through the exhibition, you'll look not just at the, uh, the images on the paper, but at the paper itself. Other manuscripts are among our finest examples anywhere from the birth of printing. And among the manuscripts in the cave, there, there were also scrolls painted on silk. Itself, yet another Chinese invention that like paper making, it was a craft that had reached great heights of sophistication, as you can see here. So we're lucky in this exhibition to have examples of all three of these, or four. We have examples of uh, excellent calligraphy, we have examples of very fine paper making, and also very fine silk making as well. Now you don't have to be an expert to appreciate the line and composition or the, the color of the paintings or the precision of the printed, printed scriptures. But the more you know about the aesthetic standards of how Chinese painting was judged, or about what made for good calligraphy, or about the craftsmanship of making paper, or the craftsmanship of making silk, uh, the more you can enjoy an exhibition like this one. Nonetheless, aside from craft and aesthetics, we can also look to this exhibit to explore belief. And that's what I want to do today, to look at this exhibition as a window on the beliefs of the people who created these caves, paintings, and manuscripts. In particular, I want to see how much we can learn about their understanding of and speculation about the afterlife. How did karma and rebirth work at Dunhuang? And how did the vision of the afterlife we see in Dunhuang reflect the day-to-day -day lives of the people who lived there? But before we get to the afterlife, let me first introduce our cast of characters. Whose beliefs are we talking about here? Broadly speaking, the objects in this exhibition represent the meeting of three types of people, craftsmen or artisans, monastics, including both monks and nuns, and donors. The craftsmen, artisans who carved out the caves, plastered and painted them, are the hardest to understand because we know so little about them. They are rarely depicted in the caves, and they didn't sign their names to their works. If it weren't for the discovery of the manuscripts, we would know next to nothing about them at all. Meticulous research on the paintings and the manuscripts, especially by the Chinese scholar Ma De, has, however, yielded a few clues. We know, for instance, various titles for different types of artisans. So there were a foreman, master craftsman, a plasterer, metal worker, and so on. Now titles like these distinguished artisans both by their craft and by their status, though only a few of the thousands who worked on the caves at Dunhuang um, left behind even their titles, much less their names. We have a few examples of painters from prominent families and evidence that some monks perform some of the manual labor of making images. But for the most part, the workers of Dunhuang were slaves, serfs, and commoners. Their clothing in the few images in which they appear reveals their status. So you can see an image like this one is typical clothing for, um, for a commoner in that they're stripped to the waist. 
Um, as you will see, the only people besides artisans who are dressed this way, who aren't wearing garments over their upper torso, are either prisoners or ghosts. Now another sign of the lowly servile status of Dunhuang's artisans comes from the manuscripts from the sealed cave that record allowances for their food. Brief accounting entries tell foremen exactly how much to feed the workers under their supervision. For example, consider this entry for two plasterers. Two plasterers, noodles in the morning, two flatbreads each at noon, supply for seven days, after which provisions are to be discontinued. <laughs> Apparently, dinner was not provided to these two poor plasterers. Or consider this crew of metal workers led by a man named Shirnunu. They were slightly better fed than the plasterers. Shirnunu and the other 20 metal workers. Noodles in the morning, three flatbreads each at noon, to be supplied for one day, after which provisions are to be discontinued. Sadly, we can't say much more about the daily lives of those who dug out, plastered, and painted the caves than this. We know much more about the monks and nuns of Dunhuang. Paintings and documents show them engaged in various activities, including preaching, meditation, um, making offerings, reciting scriptures, or traveling as pilgrims. We have a good idea of what they read and the rituals they performed. So this, you recognize this from the exhibit, this image here. Um, even though this is an idealized portrait of a pilgrim with a, you know, a tamed lion who accompanies him on his uh, travels, but still there seems to have been a pilgrim's uniform of you know, walking stick, hat, and backpack. And in addition to monks, we have many uh, rare images from Dunhuang of nuns as well. So this again is from the exhibit. Um, so anytime you see something that has a number next to it, that usually means it, it appears somewhere in the exhibits. You can go back and look at it later. So if you look in the corner of this painting, down towards the bottom, you can see a nun receiving tonsure. So you can just make out here if you look at it closely. Behind her is a senior nun, and in her hand, she's holding the, the knife that she's using to shave the head of this recent initiate. We even have substantial biographies of eminent monks um, who spent time out at Dunhuang, an important Buddhist outpost. But what has really excited enthusiasts like me isn't so much the philosophical um, writings and reflections of the elite monks. Instead, it's information we get at Dunhuang about the daily lives of ordinary, uh, run-of-the-mill monks. And this is information that we don't get anywhere else from medieval China. Meticulous scholarly detective work, in this case mostly by the historian Hao Chunwen, has uncovered some big surprises about how monks lived at Dunhuang. Among the manuscripts, Hao uncovered a type of document he calls a circular. These are texts intended to inform the monks of some event or activity. For instance, there's been flooding at the monastery, and all monks are required to help with the repairs. Then there's space on the right for monks, over here, for monks to write their name, just showing that they've read this uh, sort of memo, right? And you don't get this kind of document anywhere else from traditional China, really up until almost the modern era. But the question that struck this scholar, Hao Chunwen, when he came across these documents a decade ago in libraries in England and France, was why would a document like this be necessary in the first place? If all the monks were living together in the monastery, why would you need a, a memo, basically, to tell them that there had been flooding in their own monastery? His conclusion was that, in fact, many monks at Dunhuang didn't live in the monastery at all. They lived at home, on their farms, with their families. Others have confirmed his conclusion and added that monks lived not just with their parents and siblings, but with their wives and children. Monks at Dunhuang apparently openly married. Other monks, uh, other documents suggest that the monks of Dunhuang also didn't maintain the monastic prohibition on alcohol, that monks at Dunhuang drank alcohol um, quite openly. Now this would be no surprise if we were talking about uh, Franciscan monks or if we were talking about modern Japanese monks, but for medieval Buddhist monks, this was uh, shocking to the scholarly world. 
Aside from craftsmen and monks, the third type of person represented in the paintings, uh, sculptures, and manuscripts of Dunhuang are the donors. We have many stunning images of donors, male and female in the paintings. And we have manuscripts that detail um, their everyday lives. Aside from paintings and manuscripts, there are approximately 7,000 inscriptions in the caves, most of them recording the names of the donors who paid for the painting and sculpture and left their portraits behind, portraits like these that testify to their style and their status. These three groups of people, artisans, donors, and monastics, interacted at Dunhuang for centuries. A passage in the history of the caves by the modern scholar Ma De remarks that in Dunhuang, it was the caves that brought these people together. These types of people that ordinarily wouldn't have interacted, interacted in order to make these caves. He says it was as if they were all clinging to the same rope. But beyond the work of making Buddhist art, these different types of people, from the artisan in a loincloth living on, what was it, two flatbreads each day for lunch, to the elegant uh, gentleman or lady of distinction, they also shared in rough outline a common vision of the afterlife that motivated their actions. That is, while a universal thirst for material well-being and prestige played a major role in the construction of the caves at Dunhuang, it is just as true that this monumental project, stretching over hundreds of years, was driven as well by a belief that making Buddhist texts and images was key in negotiating not just this life, but the life to come. In fact, the vast majority of the texts and paintings of Dunhuang including most of what is in this exhibition, was at some level linked to karma and rebirth. So in the time I have here, I want to try to cover these areas. I want to begin by um, summarizing the paths of rebirth, and then moving on to the force, the moral force that pushes us from one of these paths to another, that is karma. And then to a discussion of the geography of the afterlife. Where exactly is hell, and where are the heavens, and where are we? and finally conclude with a few reflections. Um, my main point today is that through the objects in this exhibition, we can see how Buddhists have graf grappled with ideas of life after death, frequently introducing ingenious innovations as they try to make sense of mysteries that, to be honest, are no less inscrutable now than they were in medieval Dunhuang. Let's start with the basics, the paths of rebirth. Aside from a small number of really maverick, radical Buddhist thinkers, belief in rebirth is universal in the Buddhist world. According to this belief, we have all lived innumerable lives in the past. And unless we take radical action, we'll in the future live many, many lives uh, yet to come. Any number of Buddhist texts explain that when one dies, there are six possible destinations. This image from the British Museum depicts the standard set of six nicely. The worst destination uh, that we want to avoid at all costs is, of course, hell. Or more accurately, hells. So Buddhist texts give various numbers of hells. According to some texts, there are 16. Others give as many as 136 different types of hells. Here we see one of the hells in which sinners spend countless years being boiled alive while a menacing half-ox, half-human monster stirs the pot, prodding them with a trident. In others, like this one, also from the exhibition, the sinner is nailed to a hot iron bed with 500 nails. So this is the hell of 500 nails. You are nailed to this hot bed uh, with this, again, one of these monsters prodding you with a stick. There is a hell of the river of ash, in which sinners are plunged into a gray world of ash and embers and forced to tumble down a boiling river while monsters on the, brank, on the banks prod them with spears. There's a hell of jackals and wolves in which the sinners are chased by ferocious jackals and wolves driven up the banks of a riverbed until they reach trees and they begin to climb the trees when they realize that the branches of the trees are in fact themselves razor sharp uh, blades, so that as they climb the trees, their fingers and hands are lopped off and they fall back down to these ferocious jackals and wolves. 
Um, in that same hell, there are also ferocious birds with metal beaks who poke holes in your skull and suck your brains out. There's a, a hell of uh, metal, hot metal pellets in which, again, these half ox, half men heat up hot balls of metal and pour them down your gullet. There's a hell of bubbling excrement filled with these tiny, ferocious little white creatures that bore into your flesh. There is a hell in which, I could go on for a long time, I'll just give you one more. There, there, there's, there's a hell in which on being born there, you realize that your own arms are these razor sharp blades and you have an irresistible desire to attack all of those around you who also have arms made of razor sharp blades. So then begins a giant battle in which you all hack each other to pieces after which everyone seems to die, but then a cool wind blows across the hell and all the beings find themselves reconstituted once again with the same blades for arms and it all begins all over again. And so this process goes on over and over again for hundreds, thousands, even millions of years of daily perpetual slaughter. So in short, Dante was not the only master or conjurer of images to haunt the worst nightmares of the morally suspect. So let's leave this horrible area and move up to a slightly less terrifying realm, still quite terrifying, which is the realm of hungry ghosts. Hungry ghosts wander the earth, desperate, starving, unable to satiate their persistent and unending hunger. Even today, monks in China carry out a ritual for hungry ghosts every morning. So if you have a breakfast in a monastery, the monks will chant scriptures and at the end of chanting scriptures, but before beginning to eat their breakfast, one monk will take a single grain of rice or a single um, piece of noodles, depending on what they're having for breakfast, say a prayer over it, take it outside of the monastery, and toss it to the hungry ghosts who are invisibly waiting outside the monastery to eat. And the belief then is that by saying this prayer, by having a, a, a monk meditate and say a prayer over the food, it is uh, increased in quantity exponentially in the other world, giving some brief respite to these uh, pathetic creatures outside. Now, you'll notice that at Dunhuang, hungry ghosts are almost always depicted as poorly dressed, balding men with disheveled hair. And if you look at the images at the exhibition, uh, if you go back to look at them, and look especially at hair, and you'll notice that gentlemen have lush black hair tucked neatly under elegant hats. This is very, Chinese men were very particular about their hair in traditional China, and actually even today are quite particular about their hair. It, um, at barber shops, it's standard for all middle-aged men to have their hair dyed, I think. So given those circumstances, especially in ancient China when you were supposed to have very neat, long black hair, to wander the earth bald, hatless, and uncombed was literally a fate worse than death. I think I should pause for a moment of solidarity with all the bald men in the audience. <laughs> our, our people have been persecuted for centuries, as you can see. Um, next on the scale of misery are animals. Animals are generally to be pitied. They're either enslaved to humans as beasts of labor, or they're killed for their flesh. In fact, the best destination, according to Buddhist scriptures after death, is to be reborn as a human once again. As humans, we have the best chance to learn about Buddhism, the best chance to shape our future through the decisions we make. So as you can imagine, if you are in hell being chased by jackals, you have little time to learn much about anything or to make uh, considered decisions. As humans, we have the best chance to one day achieve enlightenment, become Buddhas, and, tr and transcend this tedious cycle of death, rebirth, death, rebirth again. Nevertheless, some could be forgiven for hoping instead to be reborn as asuras, demigods, or better yet, as full-fledged gods. Because while it's true that both will eventually be reborn in other realms, the gods live long lives in spectacular settings surrounded by beauty and creature comforts. In sum, all but the enlightened, Buddhas and Arhats, are trapped in this cycle. This gives hope even for hell beings who will one day, even if it takes millions of years, burn off their bad karma. They'll pay off that moral debt and rise to be reborn as humans again. 
but it also means that even the long and leisurely lives of gods have their limits. In the end, the last remnants of the good karma that they accumulated will also evaporate, and they will sink down to be reborn among human beings again. And depending on the choices they make when they are human beings, they could sink even farther. So what I just showed you is the standard set of possible rebirths. Part of what makes Dunhuang so interesting is that it preserves eccentric variations, showing how people at Dunhuang tried to wrap their heads around this grand scheme, which was unlike anything that they had seen before the entrance of Buddhism. So before Buddhism came to China in roughly, let's say, the year one, notions of the afterlife were vague and unsystematic. And archaeologists today are still attempting to puzzle out just what the first emperor was all about when he made this elaborate tomb and his underground army of terracotta soldiers. In contrast, the Buddhist system, with its meticulously described hells and paintings to go with them, seems strikingly, mesmerizingly clear. Nonetheless, Dunhuang shows that even the seemingly comprehensive airtight system that I just showed you of the six destinations, while it claims to contain all beings, can't in the end contain the religious imagination. For instance, David Neil Schmidt has drawn attention to strange variations in the standard model of six paths at Dunhuang, one of which you can see as a part of this exhibition in the painting of Chittigarbha and the Ten Kings. Here again, if you look closely at the part here in the middle, you can see five of the standard destinations. The destinations are one coming off right here. Here you should now recognize hell. And again, we have a sinner in a pot of boiling liquid being skewered by a spear. Um, above are the hungry ghosts. And if you look closely, you'll no notice that they are in fact balding. They're, they're half naked, but they have unkempt hair on either side of the bald spot. We have animals, uh, including one of the many oxen that I'll show you this afternoon. There are a number of depiction of oxen to look for in the exhibit as well and humans, well-dressed, nice cap for the man, great hair for the woman, and finally, asuras. But what's peculiar is that where we would expect to see gods, we see instead these two people being escorted above by a Buddha. Now we might take this for a mistake. The six paths are all supposed to be subject to rebirth, and Buddhas are supposed to be outside of the system. I mean, part of what makes them a Buddha is that they are no longer reborn into one of the six paths. But this same motif appears elsewhere at Dunhuang. So again, these are the paths coming out here. Here, the artisans, and maybe their patrons as well, really seem to be struggling with the categories. There is space for the demigods, but the label here says this is the human realm. And having skipped the realm of the gods for Buddhas and the demigods for humans, uh, this painting adds an entirely new category, the realm of serpents. So apparently for the artisan who made this image, snakes, for reasons I'm still puzzled about, um, shouldn't be classified as with the other animals at all. Setting aside the exact content of the various paths, the force that propels us from one birth to the next and determines where we end up when this life expires is karma. Good moral actions create good karma and bad moral decision, decisions create bad karma. At the end of our life, it's the balance of these two, good karma, bad karma, that determines where we go next. Now, there's no definitive list in the extensive Buddhist scriptures for what constitutes good karma and what bad. Most of it consists of um, fairly universal ideals of, of moral behavior. So murder creates bad karma. Assisting others in times of need is good. But some particular activities are singled out. So this is from Cave 296. And it's based on a scripture which explains the benefits of six types of activity. So here you say they're building stupas, earns you good merit planting orchards, digging wells, building monasteries, um, giving medicine to the sick, or 
finally, building bridges um, creates good merit. I just point out this last one, building bridges, had a major impact on the history of bridge building in East Asia, that when many people collected donations to build bridges throughout Chinese uh, history and Japanese history, Korean history, it was in part in order to earn merit. It's a little bit clearer here in the black and the white. You can just make them out here, these different types of activities. In the same way, making Buddhist images and copying Buddhist books are also sources of merit. They earn you good karma. Again, while there are extensive discussion of ethics before the entry of Buddhism to China, there was nothing as systematic, nothing as concrete, and at times even as mechanical as the doctrine of karma. Eventually, though, these Buddhist ideas became uni virtually universal in China. Notice the familiar figures doing the work in this image up here, working on the stupa and up on top. You just make it out on top of the monastery. These are the workers, uh, the artisans that I mentioned a few minutes ago. Some of the rare references to individual workers in the Dunhuang documents single out artisans who donated part of their labor in order to accrue spiritual merit. And we have lots of evidence of monks and donors sponsoring paintings and manuscripts for merit. But it's particularly interesting that even the workers, even the artisans at times, weren't just working for those noodles and flatbread, they were working for the spiritual merit as well. So again, most of what is on display in this exhibit was made in part to make merit for the donors and for those who did the work, with the idea being that this merit could count towards one's next rebirth. Scholar Robert Sharp has argued recently that it is a mistake to assume that the caves were used heavily for ongoing ritual practices, or even that the caves were frequently used for meditation. Once created, he's argued, they were barely used at all. The point really was in the making of merit through the creation of these caves. In theory, making merit can help one even in this life. You can do it to improve your own life. Uh, but the main reason for making merit, as revealed in countless inscriptions on Buddhist texts and images, is to acquire this sort of spiritual currency for the next life. And while it's true that making an image or copying a Buddhist text can help the donor him or herself, in general, Buddhist donors take the merit they've made and they transfer it to someone else. So you look on any bronze Buddhist image, and usually on the legs of the image you'll find an inscription in which the person who commissioned the image asks that the merit for making these, in this image be transferred to someone else. Usually it's, uh, to, it could be to a deceased child or to a sibling, but it's usually to a parent. Um, this remains true today. So if you go to the website of the International Dunhuang Project, that is busily um, digitizing all of the Dunhuang manuscripts. They have a special page called Donate a, Donate a Sutra. And on this page, you can pick your price range. And once you've picked your price range, then they give you the, the potential sutras that you can pay to have digitized. And once you click those and have one digitized, then you can, you're allowed to include a brief telephone in which you ask for the merit for digitizing this Buddhist image to go to someone else. And if you look at those, they almost always will go to um, the parents of the person making the donation. Um, among the hundreds, if not thousands, of records that pass merit on to another, perhaps the most intriguing, at least for me, is this text in the British Library on a small booklet in which the donor asks that the merit for copying scriptures be transferred in the netherworld to his trusty plow ox. He writes, For the sake of my old plowing ox, I have respectfully had copied the diamond in one fascicle and the prophecy in one fascicle. May this ox receive the merit from this and be born in a pure land, never again to be born in the body of a beast. May the offices of heaven and the prefects of the earth understand it clearly and proceed accordingly such that there be neither enmity nor dispute. So this is my favorite uh, transfer of merit document of all time. So it's something to think about when you're back in the exhibit and you're looking at that farmer and his ox on one of the long scrolls in the exhibition. But transferring merit to an animal is quite rare. Merit for making caves, paintings, or sculptures 
more often goes to teachers and to high officials, including the emperor. It goes at times to siblings and to deceased children, but by far the most common recipient of merit, uh, really throughout the Buddhist world, whether you're looking at ancient India, ancient Sri Lanka, Southeast Asia, or East Asia, are parents. Much, if not most, of Buddhist material culture began as a gift from a child to a parent to help them in the afterlife. This is as true in contemporary Buddhism as it ever was. So in a modern Chinese funeral, this is an uh, image a student of mine doing field work in Fujian took a couple years ago. In a standard Chinese funeral, at the funeral, the children of the deceased pay the monastery to chant scriptures. And then when they're done with the ritual, the merit for chanting those scriptures is transferred to the deceased, recently deceased mother or father. But how precisely does this work? Who keeps track of karma? And who makes the decision about how much is enough to warrant becoming a human again, say, instead of becoming a snake? Most Buddhist thinkers hold that karma and rebirth are simply a part of the fabric of the universe, the natural order. There's no need for any other mechanism to administer karma. No one really is in charge. Karma is a natural law. But Dunhuang, and some of the pieces in this exhibition reveal the desire to translate this abstract notion into something more tangible, something more relatable. Consider this Dunhuang painting from the Stein Collection. In the Chinese conception at Dunhuang, karma isn't an impersonal force built into the cosmos. It is instead part of an underworld bureaucracy administered by officials and their staff with brush and paper, documents and procedures administered from, from behind a big imposing desk. After death, we can expect to be taken before a magistrate, or at times a series of magistrates, charged with assessing our lives and assigning our next rebirth. Now there are a number of key figures you can see uh, even in this image. First of all, we obviously want to avoid the fate of the poor man on the right and the two men in front who are dressed like beggars, or as we've seen, dressed like workers, trapped in a kang, and in one case whipped by the magistrate's assistants even before he's assigned to his next life. Presumably, they lived wicked lives and are destined for punishment in one of those hells I described earlier. Our model should instead be the woman up front, properly dressed with tidy hair carrying an image of a Buddha, just the sort of behavior that earns good karma. I like her chances before the magistrate. The figure next to her is a minor official who carries in his arms documents that record the deeds the woman carried out in her lifetime, good and bad. So you can make out very clearly the different scrolls, which are wrapped in a sutra wrapper. So both uh, you know, thousands of scrolls like these were discovered in the cave at Dunhuang. But among them also were discovered these uh, elaborate sutra wrappers that hold them together. In another part of the scroll, we can see the same woman at a different stage of her bureaucratic journey through the courts of the afterworld. Here you can see more clearly that the judge is going over documents related to a case. Also in this image, you'll notice two figures standing next to the judge. Here, they seem to be two girls but at times you see two boys, or a boy and a girl. These are the children who tag along with you invisibly throughout your life, observing your actions. One notes all of your good deeds in, their, in her ledger book, and the other notes all of your bad deeds. I think there's something very powerful in this conception, especially for parents who know that their children observe them both in their best and all too often their worst moments. In fact, we saw these two troublesome little tattletales earlier in the corner of another painting that's in the exhibition. Note especially the scrolls. These are the ledgers of good and bad deeds that rest in their hands. But let's say the children missed something you did or introduced errors into their logbooks. Just to make sure, in the Dunhuang imagining of the other world, the judge had recourse as well to a clever device known as the karma mirror, 
that reflects actions the recently deceased took in life. In this case, the recently deceased man looks to be in a tight spot as he sees in the karmic mirror a moment in his life when he raised his fist against a monk. In the following painting from the Guimet, you see a similar case of a poor man, now in a kang and stripped of his clothing, forced to confront the time he slaughtered an ox. All of these elements come together in a single frame from the scroll of the Sutra on the Ten Kings that you can see in the exhibition. Here, we see the judge, the ledger of good deeds and bad deeds, the attendant official waiting for instructions, the two children who have spied invisibly on this man his entire life, and the man himself, again in these stocks, in this kangan loincloth. Judging by the image in the karma mirror, his prospects too are bleak. In keeping with our sub-theme of oxen, the mirror shows that when alive, he once slaughtered an ox. So if you look closely, you can just make out, you can't quite see it here. If you go back to the exhibit and look at it, you can just make out the meat cleaver he has in his hand. The frame just to the left in the same scroll in the exhibition tells a more cheerful story. Here we see one official peeking over the walls of one of the many hells to catch a glimpse of the horrors inside. So at this point, you should recognize this, right? So he's looking at this hell, which I think you can just see is again that hell of the 500 nails, of someone who's being nailed to a scalding, white-hot metal bed. But our chief protagonists, and this is why I say it's more cheerful, uh, are a man and a woman who are being whisked away on clouds to a more pleasant destination. Perhaps this is because they lived lives of devotion and compassion, or maybe it's because their relatives stepped up and contributed to building a Buddhist cave, or making a Buddhist painting, or even copying out an illustrated Buddhist manuscript like this in their honor. Oops. Devotees at Dunhua weren't content to imagine scenes from the bureaucracy of the other world even with detailed paintings like the one we just saw. They wanted to know just how it all fit together, where they were and where deceased relatives might be. In other words, they wanted a description of the world that included all of the realms I've discussed so far. They wanted the whole picture all together. Buddhist scriptures were transported from India to China over the course of centuries. And in China, they were translated into Chinese as part of the Chinese Buddhist canon, which I think is the, the greatest translation project in the history of the world, really, the translation of Buddhist scriptures into Chinese. Some of these provide detailed textual descriptions that lay out the structure of the cosmos. And some of the most important of these texts were well known at Dunhua. But beyond this, artisans, perhaps in conjunction with monks and probably sponsored by donors, went a step further. They made a map. This is a map of the cosmos, now in the National Library in Paris. Um, this particular piece isn't in the exhibition, so fortunately we all still have a good excuse to go to Paris. <laughs> Starting from the bottom, our entire world system floats on a disk of wind, and the force of this disk of wind supports a disk of water, which in turn supports a thick layer of gold. This is the foundation, not just for the world of humans, but for the hells, the heavens, and everything else. Above this, on the ground floor, are the gates of hell. In some texts, the hells are located not below us, but on the same level, just far, far away, beyond the most distant mountain range that rings our world. Again, it's wrong to speak of hell in the singular. There are many hells, each with its own characteristics. In some texts, Depending on their karmic debt, when sinners have spent vast stretches of time suffering in one hell, they are permitted to die, only to be reborn in yet another hell, and so on, through various hells, such that it is only after many lives that a truly depraved sinner has finally worked off enough bad karma to have a chance to be reborn at a higher level. It makes sense that there's a separate gate for the hungry ghosts, who, according to some, are only allowed to roam among the world of humans during certain times of the year, in China particularly during the annual ghost festival. But more puzzling, at least to me, is that animals are placed here rather than among humans. 
This suggests that perhaps the map is only partly locating space and as it is at the same time a map of concepts and even maybe a map of psychological states. This briefly is our world right here. We all live on this continent. And according to this traditional Buddhist conception, there are four major continents. You can't see one, it's behind the mountain here. Everything the people of Dunhuang knew, all of the lands of their world, including India and China, all of the people of the world are here on a single continent surrounded by water, itself surrounded by a vast mountain range. Ours is just one of four continents. The others contain other creatures. But again, we are lucky to be here, since this is the only continent on which a Buddha can appear. In the center of these four continents, surrounded by seven mountain ranges, is Mount Sumeru. The sun and the moon circulate around this mountain. This is the sun. A uh, student of mine, Dan Tezeo, is writing his dissertation on Buddhist cosmology in China, and he just pointed out to me that there is another depiction of the world uh, within the Dunhuang Caves. This is Cave 61. You have to look up in a corner and uh, look at it in more detail to see it here. So here, you can make out at least three of the motifs that should be familiar to you now. Right? So you can see that this is the cosmos, and this is our continent, there are four continents, so we're here. Also in the same painting, we have a good example of a karma mirror. And your guess is as good as mine. It looks to me like he has a devout posture in the mirror, so I think he's, he's looking good. Um, and up here, the familiar, once again, the balding shirtless men with uncombed hair that we now know are hungry ghosts. Now above this, this realm where we live, are a series of heavens. Again, just as in the hells, the beings who live here can have enormous lifespans stretching over eons. But just as for the hell beings, those who live here are not immortal. Eventually, even the gods will die. Even the gods will exhaust their karma and fall farther down the scroll. As you can see, there are many levels of heaven. Descriptions of them in Buddhist scriptures explain that they become increasingly ethereal or abstract the farther up they go. And if hell allowed a space to imagine us at our most brutal and savage, the heavens provided a mental space to explore the reaches of the most refined. High up above the celestial bodies, above the sun and moon, gods note the passing of days, not by the rising and setting of the sun, but by the opening and closing of flowers. In one of the heavens, we're told that the gods no longer communicate with sound. They're too refined to use sound to communicate. Instead, they communicate only with light. In one of the higher heavens, male and female gods, in place of intercourse, need only hold hands. In a higher heaven still, laconic gods need only exchange a few words. And in a higher heaven yet, there's no longer a distinction in gods between male and female. These are strange and wonderful worlds that even today stretch the imagination. My hope is that by this point I've provided enough information to inspire at least a few of you to return to the exhibition, or maybe to crack open the exhibition catalog. This time to look at the pieces in the exhibition for clues as to what was happening behind these objects, how monastics, uh, donors, and artisans imagined the afterlife. If you look closely, you should find evidence for the karmic mirror and the two children who record our actions, the realms of hell and hungry ghosts, and the foundations of belief in rebirth and karma. And I hope I've summarized Buddhist views on the afterlife, afterlife enough to give you some context when you look for these motifs. But at the same time, I want to emphasize that at some level, everyone imagines the afterlife differently. We each adapt our vision of the other world to suit our own needs. We've seen how some artisans at Dunhuang tinkered with the six-part formula to create a separate realm of rebirth for snakes. How they imagined an underworld bureaucracy in which clerks keep track of our lives with brush and paper. Some located the hells beneath us, and others were sure that the hells must exist so horizontally, uh, far, but far away, beyond the most distant mountain range. And Buddhist thinkers grappled with the details 
of just how all of this works. For instance, the Abhidharma Kosha, preserved in part among the Dunhuang manuscripts, raises the question of how to assess the karma of those monsters that act as wardens of hell. So these figures have come up a number of times. They're always described as having ox heads and human bodies. But they're absolutely essential for maintaining order in hell and also for contributing with their spears and their frightening demeanor to the suffering of the sinners they oversee. But this raised a problem for our Buddhist exegetes who asked, if by torturing the damned, these half-animal, half-human monsters, aren't they themselves creating bad karma? And if that's true, aren't they stuck in a kind of a karmic loop in which they're constantly creating bad karma that will keep them in hell forever? Doesn't this defeat this basic principle of your ability to move from one destiny to the next? And this hardly seems fair, given that they are really just following orders. They're doing their jobs. They're, they are humble foot soldiers in a vast netherworldly army. Now the exegetes propose various ingenious solutions, including the suggestion that the wardens of hell aren't sentient beings at all, but are instead a kind of automaton that are propelled by the collective karma of all sentient beings. Or better yet, that they are illusions created in the minds of the damned. For another example of this sort of variety, in China, Storytellers reason that if the afterworld is a bureaucracy, it must follow that it is subject to the same sort of corruption, mishaps, and blunders that plague any large bureaucracy. This is a realization that inspires stories of the wrong people dying before their time because of clerical errors. So there's, a famous, there's one famous story of these two uh, officials who were sent from the other world to bring down a soul, but they found that the man they were supposed to bring back down to be judged was reciting the Diamond Sutra. And because he was reciting the Diamond Sutra, he was surrounded by this powerful aura. And they, they noticed that there was someone else in the next village who had the same name as he did. So instead, they went and got the other guy from the other village and took him down. So there are any number of stories like this in, in uh, Chinese popular literature. Now, up in the world of the living, Buddhist writers, including both laymen and monks, debated as well the consequences of eating meat, to just give one example of ethical quandaries. Uh, Buddhists attributed bad karma traditionally only to the butcher who slaughtered animals and not to those who ate the, the meat that the butcher prepared. But from the 6th century, some in China began to argue that those who purchased meat from the butcher were themselves complicit in some way in the killing of the animal and hence should reap the consequences of that bad karma. This argument, along with the realization that the animal you eat now may in a previous existence have been your mother, led eventually to establishing vegetarianism as the norm for Buddhism in China, at least for monks and nuns. In conclusion, my point is this. The paintings, sculptures, and texts of Dunhuang reflect that the afterlife was on the minds of the people who created them. These are concerns that permeate the objects in this exhibition. In the variety of ways they expressed their beliefs, we see them all, the monks, the donors, and the artisans, grappling not just with where we go after death, but also with what it means to live a good and meaningful life. Now this is the uh, conclusion of my talk, but if, uh, I can, if you'll give me just one more uh, minute. Um, my, my parents drove up from San Diego to hear me give this talk, and as any of you have driven to uh, I-5 in traffic, no. There are levels of hell that even the monks of Denmark could, could not have imagined. So um, if there is any merit in a PowerPoint presentation, I know it's not much, I want to donate the merit to my parents for coming up. Thank you. Questions, if you'd like, maybe just to, just for a couple minutes, and then I'll stay afterwards. If any of you have uh, specific questions you'd like to ask, yeah, yes, yes, please. So, so around about the sixth century, this black guy comes in and says to the emperor, "Look, the emperor says to look, I've done all these things. What's my merit?" And he looks at it and says, "No merit." And he marches off. And he goes, "Who's that? Well, he's the latest saint." And so they've got these these secular. 
So you get these secular cracks happening, and, they're, they're hap and I assume they're reflected to a certain degree in, the, in this uh, the Dune Huang art. I'm curious, how do you see the secular differences? Well, that's, that's a really a Buddhist position. So this is a famous story of Bodhidharma going to see the emperor. And the emperor, is, who's a famous emperor who's done and uh, made many monasteries and ordained many monks, and he says, how much merit do I earn by all of my good works? And Bodhidharma says, no merit at all. Because it plays really to the notion of authenticity and sincerity. So that's also been that preys on the minds of many, even in inscriptions, of what counts for good merit. And it's the same problem uh, you see in other religious traditions, too. If a rich person donates um, a small amount of wealth, is that the same as a poor person donating a great amount of wealth? So these were topics that were very much at the heart of Buddhist ethics and Buddhist discussion for centuries. Anywhere? Any? I just had a really good question in your um, talk, talk. You're ascribing a, a certain level of autonomy to all three of these groups that you have on the screen. And I was wondering, um, as far as the craftsmen were concerned, how much autonomy they had in terms of determining what they put on the walls and how they looked. Yeah, we, I would love to have details about how they set out these programs for the caves. But usually, I think we're left really with speculation of who was in charge. And especially, I'd be very curious to know how much could the artisans do on their own? And I guess the answer is, it's, I still think it's anyone's guess as to who was really deciding what to put on a given wall. Yeah. We try to come over here. Thank you for a fascinating talk. I always thought that heaven and hell were invented by Christian early church fathers. You show that what might be an independent invention by the Buddhists, was there a connection that one learned from the other, especially the tortures? Hell is a place of torture, which both share. Yeah, there are striking similarities. I mean, all the Buddhist idea of heaven and hell is very, very ancient. So it goes back to the very beginnings of Buddhism. And as far as I know, there's no evidence of a direct connection between the two. As far as I know, and maybe it's even more interesting if they were developed independently. Maybe just take one more question, and then if you have any other individual questions afterwards. I want to leave time, so if you want to go back and actually see the, the exhibition again, you can still see it. Yes? Uh, you were describing the, uh, uh, the reverence for animals and the fact of becoming vegetarians uh, in Buddhism. I mean, is there, was there any behavior, any evidence of behavior of treating animals the way that they're revered in, in Hinduism and now, what, would, what would explain the difference? Well, the one interesting difference, again, are those oxen that I showed you. So there wasn't this notion in traditional China that they were particularly sacred, but they were revered because of the work they did on the farm. And that really continued throughout Chinese history. So up until only very recently did Chinese start to eat beef on a wide scale. So now this the standard beef noodles is a kind of a standard Chinese dish. But uh, if you talk to a previous generation, maybe the great grandparents of someone alive today, they would never have eaten beef noodles. So there was a strict prohibition on eating oxen because of that. And I could just, I could just say one more point, which was I always really liked that um, dedication of merit of the farmer to his ox, because I thought it was really touching of a farmer who felt sympathy for his ox and had this special relationship, felt a kind of kindness and affection for his ox until I had a graduate student who pointed out to me the last part of that inscription where he says, let there be no enmity for this, and suggested that perhaps he mistreated his ox, and felt guilty about mistreating his ox, and he was worried that in another life, this ox would come back and wreak a kind of punishment on him. So the, complete, the graduate student completely ruined that uh, moment for me. <laughs> okay, thank you all very much.